room plan forward students and alums and other interested hangers on. I'm Keith Mayer, professor of marketing and director of. Let's hear it. You like it. Okay. You want those words, those letters on everybody's lips? Say it with me again. So, since you're all familiar with, with who we are, I don't need to give you the whole dog and pony show about what we do. But one thing that we do is we hold events like this. We want to connect alums with each other, with current and prospective students. And so, again, just really happy to have an opportunity to do just that. And not just any old connection. But if, if you're not aware of the background of the two gentlemen who are with us this afternoon, when they reel off names like Apple and Microsoft and Google and, of course, Facebook, you know you're in the right place. And for those of you who want to do some sucking up for jobs or professional networking, this is a good day to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so glad you're with us. Uh, we're going to jump right in. And my name is the first. Introduce Christian Hernandez. So Christian's a, a working alum, MBA alum, uh, did his, his work at Duke before that. Uh, and, and what a resume. I don't know how many of you would be familiar with uh, the first company he worked for, MicroStrategy. Some of you are too young to remember. But it was the absolute darling of, of, of at, at the height of the dot com days. Everybody looked at them and their CEO, Michael, Michael Saylor, that said, We do no wrong. Well, you know, let's go up, let's come down. Uh, fortunately, a, a Christian and Scott's MBA and figured out how to do things the right way. Uh, went from here to Microsoft, uh, worked with their smartphone group. Back in the day when we thought Microsoft might be able to develop a company phone. Uh, there are you know, some signs that they might be able to do it again. Maybe. Uh, so that was fun for a while. We got straight out of Wharton. And then went to a little company, I think some of you would have heard about uh, Google, that's it, Google. Yeah. <laughs> Google, you might have heard of that. Uh, and so uh, uh, spearheading a lot of their international operations. And then moving on to Facebook uh, about a year ago, um, running all of their international business development. So recognizing that like three quarters of all Facebook users are outside of this country, or some number, a phenomenal number like that, uh, Christian can take credit for each and every one of them. So, uh, so I'm really delighted to, to turn things over to Christian, and then I'll, I'll introduce David after that, so that his bio will be fresh in mind. Uh, uh, Christian's going to spend about a few minutes on this, on his perspectives on uh, the, the future of media, the interactions between traditional and emerging media. So, uh, 20 minutes for Christian, 20 minutes for David, and then lots of Q&A for the rest of the time. Christian, Hey, everyone. Uh, appreciate you spending your lunch time with us. Um, I guess come back here about twice a year uh, for the Alumni Association board, which is really fun to come back and just hang out at the home pay the same amounts of money for cheap coffee and uh, <laughs> on to the Wi-Fi. Uh, so it makes me feel like I'm still hanging to the school. Thank you for the invitation to Wimi. Uh, really excited to talk to you guys about our view on media and where we think it's going. Caveat, it's completely biased towards Facebook and what I do for a living, but it's, it's <laughs> our view. Um, 20 minutes on effectively where media has come from and where we think it's going. So the nice uh, flicker picture of what media used to be when television first came around, everybody getting around the television and watching one specific show at 8 p.m. on those few broadcast channels available at the time. I don't think media has changed too much from this. It still is people coming together to watch Mad Men at a specific time on television. I mean, those promise about uh, online consumption of television, you know, anytime, anywhere, place shifting, time shifting hasn't really happened yet. Uh, the, the money is still on television, the audience is still on television, and despite what I hype up for a living, um, the evolution to digital has not been as fast as it could have been, primarily because there's a fair amount of interest from the broadcasters to keep the billions of dollars of getting there. So when I go and talk to a media company in uh, Italy, for example, my first slide has the fact that we're 16 million users in Italy. 16 million users is larger than the reach of any TV channel, any individual show, any newspaper, any other media. Um, and I told the telemarketer the ability to target 16 million people across one single day is going to cost them one tenth, one one hundredth 
and what a 30 second spot in TV could have. So when we think about where media is going, reach is important, but I think reach, which TV has always hyped, is obsolete by that point. When you have 500 million users, and you can do a broad, segment, broad targeting, but then you can also do a very, very micro-segmentation of advertising, we believe and we hope that uh, markets begin to realize the power actually lies on TV, but also off TV. And what we're seeing is dual consumption of content. People watching Mad Men, but also talking about it on their Twitter accounts, on Facebook, to each other over email, this water cooler effect expanding through social networks. So my belief is that the future of media is social. And it's triggered by what people care about, how people interact with media, and how they interact with the television, but the set-top box, their PC, their mobile phone, all at the same time. So our challenge to us, Facebook, is to figure out a way to harness that conversation and add value to both the broadcaster, but also the, the, the marketer. So um, Marshall McLuhan is uh, this philosopher that is revered within Facebook. Um, he said that the medium was the message, right? You need to be able to target um, the audience based on the medium. Print or television or radio all have very different mediums. Mobile advertising needs to take into account there's a very small screen. It offers capabilities, but also has uh, some hamperings around the form factor. I have to challenge that and say that today, people are the medium. The, we are the creators of content, YouTube being the prime example, Twitter, us. Um, we are the ones that actually influence and drive the conversation. We are the ones that can actually make a piece of content relevant or irrelevant. All these YouTube videos that go viral all happen because we click on play. Because we actually, somebody generated that video of the kid going to the dentist high on whatever he's on. <laughs> and all millions of us have consumed it. So the evolution is going from us as the power holders rather than the broadcasting director deciding what he's going to slot in at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday night. And we have the ability to actually now consume television wherever we want, whenever we want. So I live in the UK. Um, the UK has a very interesting media structure. I pay a tax every year. I pay 140 pounds to the government to actually have free TV, the BBC. So the BBC is subsidized by me, um, which leads to some interesting issues. But effectively, I also have a sense of entitlement that I want to be able to watch the BBC wherever I want to watch it. They developed this awesome thing called Type Player. Uh, I players are not available here for political reasons, but it's effectively Hulu on steroids. It's actually a database of all the content they have across time with very rich content, a recommendation engine and what you should watch based on what your friends have watched, what you should watch based on what you've watched before. Um, I never watch TV anymore in a consequential fashion. I get home, I plug an iPlayer, I discover what I might want to consume, I plug my PC into my TV, and I actually choose when I want to watch something. I have a sling box back to my in-laws uh, TiVo here in the US. So I'm watching Lost every single day, one day after it happened here. I, I chose what to watch and when to watch it. When my wife's not around, I watch geeky history channel shows. When she's around, we get to watch uh, Housewives, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that time I don't get to choose. <laughs> um, but I now have the power to choose the content, the medium, and the time. And so, Combine that with the ability for us to create content, I really believe that we as people, we as the social web that connects content, now drive the consumption of the world. So we, Facebook by definition is a, a identity and sharing platform, right? We, we have, you come on and you authenticate with your, with your email. When I first joined Facebook, I had to authenticate with my WhartonAlumni.edu account still going for students. But we know at the core that you, you are a real person. You're not uh, you know, Latino at Warden um, blah 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 avatar. You actually have a real identity. And that real identity means they can discover your real friends. And then you have a fairly comfortable assumption that these really are your friends. And then you start connecting with them and you start sharing content with them. You start sharing pictures of your baby. You start sharing, well, in your case, pictures of the Walasa party last week. Uh, <laughs> pictures of um, the latest spring break escapades. Um, pictures of learning teams. And then you start having conversations around that content. From that conversation, it, it also evolves into the article you found in some magazine that you thought was interesting and you share with your friends. Or the YouTube video you thought was really funny and you click on and share it. 
or the article of clothing you just saw on some website, you actually want to show off to your friends because you just, you just bought it. So we as a sharing platform are becoming a recommendation engine for things that are relevant to us and we make the assumption relevant to your friends. At least some of my friends will disagree on how much I share, but I work at a company so I get away with it. Um, so if you have, if you multiply 500 million people times a status update per day of different kinds, times content that's being shared onto Facebook and then shared off of Facebook through this social algorithm, you start creating this, um, this filter effect. I now read my news in the morning, not by going to the New York Times mobile app, but by opening up my Twitter feed. Fairly likely that the people I follow on Twitter are going to be reading stuff that's relevant to me. So I now follow David, and he has some good articles and posts, so I now have one more news source. I don't log on to Facebook to actually get some enjoyment about what my friends have done around the world. I log on to YouTube and discover my you know, 1.5 minutes of entertainment while I'm actually uh, having my lunch. And it's all filtered by my friends, or at least my social graph. People that are within a certain degree of me and that might uh, therefore have certain affinities that are similar to mine. Um, so is there anybody in a journalist in the room? Or former journalist? So the journalists and like the newspaper guys usually tell me, well, that loses the, the value of serendipity, the value of professional journalism, the value of um, content that we editorially decided was relevant that we'll put in the front page. I'd argue that the front page is very, very different for all of us. We've all been forced to read your front page because an editor wanted to have this headline to sell more newspapers. I guarantee you that my front page and your front page and your front page is very different. So, the front page that we claim you can create is effectively a front page that's filtered by your friends. And then the content you can actually consume is stuff that hopefully will be more relevant to you. I mean, Flipboard is a great example, right? Everybody loves Flipboard because it's the start and end concept of a magazine with the social component to it. And it just has the, the beauty of actually sifting through the pages and reading updates and tweets. So if it's professional content, and we are a really good source of, of traffic back to media sites, some of it's tweets from people telling you the hand programs. But it all matters. So we think that the social um, aspects of, of content discovery and consumption will actually generate a new, new way of discovery. And I'll show you some examples of it. I talked about